On the afternoon of May 11th, 1996, ValueJet Airlines Flight 592 took off from Miami International Airport on a flight to Hartsfield Jackson International Airport in Atlanta, Georgia. After only 10 minutes in the air, however, the plane crashed into the Florida Everglades just a few miles west of Miami. How could this plane have crashed shortly after takeoff with no signs of inclement weather or structural failure? The aircraft, a McDonnell Douglas DC-9, was 27 years old at the time of the accident and had previously been flown by Delta Airlines. After being retired and sold back to McDonnell Douglas, it was subsequently sold again in 1993, this time to ValueJet. Founded in 1992, ValueJet Airlines was known for its sometimes aggressive cost-cutting measures. Many of its planes were purchased used from other airlines. Little training was provided to workers, and contractors were used for maintenance and other services. The airline quickly acquired a reputation for its lax safety, and by 1995, the Federal Aviation Administration wanted the airline grounded. On the afternoon of May 11, 1996, the aircraft commenced takeoff after a delay of just over an hour due to mechanical problems. On board were 110 passengers and crew. At 2.10 p.m., just six minutes into the flight, passengers started to smell smoke. At the same time, the pilots heard a loud bang in their headsets and noticed the plane was losing electrical power. Seconds later, one of the flight attendants opened the cockpit door to inform the pilots of a fire in the passenger cabin. Shouts of, fire, 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 coming from the passenger cabin could be heard on the cockpit voice recorder once the door was opened. The pilots immediately asked air traffic control for a return to Miami and were given instructions for a return to the airport. At 2.13, Flight 592 disappeared from radar. Eyewitnesses nearby watched as the plane banked sharply, rolled onto its side and nosedived into the Everglades at a speed in excess of 507 miles per hour, 816 kilometers per hour. All on board were killed. Recovery of the aircraft and victims was made extremely difficult by the location of the crash, a deep water swamp with the nearest road more than a quarter of a mile away. The search eventually turned up some, but nowhere near all, of the value jet DC-9. Although the black boxes were found intact, the same could not be said of the occupants. The human remains at the site consisted only of small pieces of flesh, many of which were too badly contaminated to permit any sort of testing. Eventually, remains of 68 of the 110 victims were positively identified. However, autopsies were out of the question. The recovery operations in the swamp were further hampered by the presence of venomous snakes and alligators. Investigators would pick out each piece of debris by hand, while snipers kept watch for alligators. After a 15-month investigation, the National Transportation Safety Board determined that the fire started in a cargo hold below the passenger cabin. As an airtight compartment, it was not fitted with smoke detectors. Investigators determined that just before takeoff, expired chemical oxygen generators had been placed in the cargo hold by employees of Sabertech, ValueJet's maintenance contractor. This was in violation of FAA safety rules on transporting hazardous materials. The contractors also failed to cover the generator's firing pins with the required plastic caps. Chemical oxygen generators, when activated, produce oxygen for passengers if the plane suffers a decompression. However, they also produce a lot of heat due to the chemical reaction involved. Therefore, not only could the heat and generated oxygen start a fire, but the oxygen could also keep the fire burning, no matter how airtight the cargo hold may be. It was also determined that one of the oxygen generators was likely triggered when the plane experienced a slight jolt while taxiing. As the aircraft taxied and took off, the activated generator got hotter and hotter. Soon, the boxes and surrounding packaging ignited, starting a fire. The NTSB report placed responsibility for the accident on three parties. 
Sabertech for improperly packaging and storing hazardous materials, ValueJet for not supervising Sabertech, and the FAA for not mandating smoke detection and fire suppression systems in cargo holds, as recommended in 1988 after a similar incident. In 1997, a federal grand jury indicted Sabertech for mishandling hazardous materials, failing to train its employees in the proper handling, conspiracy, and making false statements. The company was fined $2 million and ordered to pay an additional $9 million in restitution. That same year, ValueJet acquired Airtran Airways. ValueJet executives believed that a name change would help to restore passenger confidence. Airtran made little mention of its past as ValueJet. In 2011, the airline was purchased by Southwest Airlines. Many families of Flight 592's victims were outraged that ValueJet was not prosecuted, given the airline's poor safety record. The airline's accident rate was not only one of the highest of the low-fare airlines, but also 14 times higher than that of legacy airlines. In 1999, on the third anniversary of the disaster, a memorial was dedicated to the victims in the Everglades. Consisting of 110 concrete pillars, one for each victim, the memorial points to the location of the crash site, 12 miles away.